Welcome to Malpractice Podcast. Are you ready to get started? Oh, hello. I am ready to get started. (laughs) You're Sid, and I'm Jess. I am Sid, and you are Jess. And we're your hosts of Malpractice Podcast. (laughs) We've been that way the whole time. (laughs) Oh, my God. It snowed here in Austin. It did not snow here, and I'm very jealous. It was like a winter wonderland, and I'm not kidding. You were sending me pictures and videos, and my mom was sending me pictures and videos of her sledding this uh-huh. morning. This morning? This morning. She was like, before work, I went sledding. And I was like, well, aren't you just a little Midwesterner? She's so she's such a little cute angel face. She is. Um, she was so excited to go sledding. She sent me a video of like her and her dog sledding. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. that's perfect. Did you guys play in the snow? Yes, Corey was, like, really into it. She loved it, huh? You sent me one video of her. She's so cute. She stepped in it, and she was like, this is my shit right here. In case you're not from here, it never snows in Texas. I live in Houston. Jess lives in Austin, and we, like, never get snow. Houston just became a gross mess, honestly. Yeah, you should leave (laughs) and come here. (laughs) No. Why? Why? I like it here. No, you not. Yes, I do. I know. I'm a Houston home homer. A Houston homer. Yeah. That's sh- what that's that what mean? they should rename the Astros. <laughs> a Houston oh. homer. Okay. Yeah. I know I do not agree with you. That is not a cute name. <laughs> All the Astro <laughs> fans sounds- are about to unfollow us. <laughs> Honestly, they probably already have. Um, don't, don't do that, you guys. <laughs> It sounds like uh, Homer from The Simpsons. Like, that's the first thing I thought of. Me too. Do, 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 do. We can't afford that song. I shouldn't sing it. Do not sing that. We are not paying for it. Reverse, reverse. We'll we'll get sued. I'll have to cut that out. (sighs) What else? Um, So we, so Corey is scared of snowmen, we discovered. So she. (laughs) I authentically don't blame her because. I don't know. It's kind of scary. What if somebody pops out of a snowman? A la The Office. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of. When he makes all those snowmen and then he pops out of one? No, No, that's scary. Yeah. No, she, can't she has no him. reason to be scared. Like, she's scared of things that are, like, stationary, like, statues. She's scared. Like, we passed one not, time. Not unfair. Like, a, a lion. And she mm-hmm. was like, what is yeah that. and I'm like it's a lot li- she wouldn't even walk she was like on the ground like like petrified like couldn't oh my move. god I was like it's not real she clearly has some lion trauma from her past I mean same <laughs> in another well, life well really tigers <laughs> I'm like really afraid of tigers you that know that book this. that you gave me that tiger the tiger that ate like 600 people no yes uh-uh they're too smart they get in your house mm-hmm. snatch you out uh-uh tigers don't they, play and you can't hear they them they snatch children yeah you can't see yes. them either they'll snatch you off of an elephant look it up they'll snatch a child out of a encampment they're like this is Hell my child no. now uh-uh no jungle book for me Mm-mm. you sure can't? you can't you can't trust a tiger. And what I think we all learned this summer is that you can't trust people who keep tigers as pets either. So. <laughs> <laughs> For the, you can't see us, but we had some meaningful eye contact there. No, you can never trust someone that keeps tigers as a pet. That was the truest thing I've ever said. I stand by it. That's a new life rule. <laughs> Cosine. That's, <laughs> come on. No. Yeah. No, that that show, oh, that show, Tiger that King. Show, that man. Ooh, every in every person still. in that show. First of all, yeah. I don't know why well, everyone yeah. in that show isn't under investigation. I'm investigating them. What I would like know? to. I'm gonna call the FBI and be like, "Look, I don't know if y'all are aware." <laughs> Can we investigate? <laughs> 
That show is crazy. I did watch it like four times. <laughs> no, same. And then I watched the recap. Mm-hmm. We watched it on the, FaceTime. About, <laughs> yeah, it was good. <laughs> it was wild. It was bad, so it was good. I I stand by that. I love trash TV. Have you seen any other good shows lately? I'm always watching um, America's Toughest Prisons. It's a show oh my on. God. It's it's really good. So it's a show on Netflix that this guy who was in, I believe, the UK, he was in a prison for mm-hmm. a murder, but he didn't commit the murder. So he was there for like twelve mm. years, and then they released him. They're like, oh shit, sorry. So yeah. now he like has this show where he goes around and he spends like a week in the toughest prisons in the world. So. He's got five seasons, um, and it's really, cool. really good. It's really, it's it's good, and it doesn't surprise me necessarily. Like, Wait, so is he pretending what? to be a prisoner? No, they know that he's oh, they there know. for that purpose, but they okay. treat him like like a normal they, prisoner. He goes in, yeah. They go. He goes in with no money, no gang affiliations, and he's just like super honest with them and like wants to know stuff. There was one on, I guess it was the last season, mm-hmm. and that was the only one that I was super shocked about. And I can't remember where he was, but they were basically living, like, in a shack, like the prisoners. Ugh. And they had, like, not enough food. Clearly not enough food to feed everyone, so some people just didn't well, eat. Okay. Oh, my God. That yeah. sounds it like was, a violation of everyone's rights all around. It was really bad. So it's yeah. it's really, it's a good show. But, I mean, <laughs> that's just my vibe always. Speaking of prisons, um, I just watched this new true crime show. The ID channel has started putting stuff on Hulu. Ooh. And there's this show about this woman named Susan Powell. I think it was from like 2009. But okay. basically, she and her husband go quote unquote camping because you don't know what's up with the husband. He's They're Mormon, but the husband is like shady AF. <gasps> what? How? And- how is he shady? Well, she just, the wife goes camping with them and then like never comes back. The detectives like talk to the kids and they're like, where was your mommy? And they're like, she went camping with us, but she was in the trunk. (gasps) Yeah. Oh, he absolutely did it. I mean, they never proved it. You just need to watch it. It is crazy. I'll watch it tomorrow. You know, I will. I can't believe that none of the true crime podcasts that I listen to have covered Susan Powell because that case is insane and honestly sydney is the number one subscriber to all true crime podcasts so if you guys haven't covered it (laughs) shame on you (laughs) i literally am they did that like spotify wrapped and they were like bitch are you okay (laughs) that was what spotify (laughs) said to me they're like are you okay do you want to talk about something are you gonna murder someone (laughs) you like recommend they recommend to you like um the online counseling counseling. (laughs) they're like virtual (laughs) counseling is available to you (laughs) yeah they're like Um, do you have some trauma you need to work out? Yes. Yes. And I do so listening to my podcast. Mm -hmm. I just like to know what the worst case scenario is. I just want to know what's, what's the thing that no one expects to happen that happens to people. That's what I want to know. So you can avoid it. (laughs) Yeah. I want to be ready all the time, just in case. (laughs) Do you like that? Do you like to be prepared? I am worst case scenario, Jess. I literally (laughs) live. You definitely are. I live in fear that the worst case thing is going to happen. Jessica will get a bump on her arm and be like, this is skin cancer. I guarantee it. And I get it removed, which is an extremely, (laughs) this is a true story. That's what she, I have, I had this like little mole that I was like convinced had grown and I went to the dermatologist and they were like, well, we can take it off. And I was like, yeah, if I can take it off. I used to be a crazy hypochondriac when I was a kid. One time I got a cut on my toe and I put bandages on every single toe because I was like, the other toes are going to be jealous of that one toe getting special attention. You are such an only child. <laughs> I definitely am. But also now I'm like, eh, eh, what, what's the worst that can happen? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not chill. I have no And the chill. answer is skin cancer. <laughs> Bingo. Fucking get it removed. Get your toe removed. No. <laughs> get to cut Take it off. Toe. Get it out of here. Get it out. <laughs> Chop it off. Biopsy it. Send it out for <laughs> testing. And I'm crazy now. Poor Corey has- You're a helicopter dog mom. <laughs> well, she's doing a lot better. So we got, I think I told you and our listeners before, mm-hmm. like she got bad, a bad review at doggy daycare. <laughs> um, did I tell you that? No. <laughs> Okay, well, it's because basically they said, like, she doesn't listen to social cues, which, same. (laughs) 
So Michelle's so practical. She's like, well, what do you recommend you yeah. do like to fix it? And the girl was like, X, Y, Z, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Well, I wasn't there. Mm-hmm. So, and then when she, when Michelle told me, I was like, well, no, she doesn't. <laughs> she doesn't have it. <laughs> if they told me my dog missed social cues, I would have been like, well, she was homeschooled. So. Also, I kind of get her vibe because like, have you ever had someone not like you and there's like not a good reason and you're just. You're just like yes, disappointed. I was gay and you're like, in I need you to like Texas. me. Are you joking? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're just like, I need yes. you to like me. Why don't you like me? I'm a good person. And it bothers you. I think that gives you like a thicker skin when you have to like figure that out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You were like, I'm gay. And I was like, I know. And I'm hungry. <laughs> I, I, yeah, if we're going to just state facts here, I'm <laughs> Is that what we're doing? <laughs> we state facts now? Aww. Yeah. I remember that. I have, like, vivid memories of that. Oh, same. McDonald's that is, like, a very day. sharp memory. Right. When I have Alzheimer's and can't remember anything because it runs in my family, I'll remember that. So, for our listeners who don't know what we're talking about, Jess came out to me at a McDonald's and we were sitting there eating french fries. <laughs> We live in Nacogdoches, Texas. At this time, we didn't have many places to go. We were we also 16 and had, like, no money. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Hence McDonald's. We are having a good time. One dollar fries. And those chicken nuggets. Listen, I would put down a box of McDonald's french fries right now. I ain't too good for that this, shit. This was before I stopped eating meat, so I would eat those nuggets. Just because we got a podcast doesn't mean we're too good for McDonald's. And their coffee is not bad. There was like a coffee snob review about which things were the best at McDonald's, and their latte was on the top five list, so I ordered it last time, and I was like, this is damn good, honestly. I've had worse coffee from, like, coffee shops. Same. That costs like $12. And shame on y'all for that. <laughs> exactly. You're not going to no. get oat milk at McDonald's, but. They have cow's milk okay. or GTFO. <laughs> Those are the options. Literally, literally. And they don't care. No, they like, don't give whatever. a hot damn. Are you ready to hear my story for today? I am ready. I don't know if you are ready because it is so interesting. Okay. I don't think you're ready for this story. I don't think you're ready. <laughs> I am ready. <laughs> we can't afford the rights to that song either. What if I what if I make it, if I re- change the lyrics, can we use that mm. or not? I don't know the law. There's a, we should look that up. <laughs> don't, <laughs> please don't sue us, Beyonce. We are your number one fans. Oh, I'm, I forgot that was Beyonce. Literally queen. So sorry. You can have <laughs> so- everything I own. I already gave it to her. My house is in Beyonce's name. (laughs) Eric would be so mad. He would be pissed. I like signed the contract as Beyonce. So (laughs) today I'm going to tell you and our listeners about Dr. Rita Levi Montalcini. Montalcini. I'm going to say it like that every single time. And I'm so sorry. I love that. So this woman is a bad bitch if there ever was one. Love this was it. actually a listener recommendation, and I'm kind of ashamed to say that I had never heard of her before researching this story. So a huge thank you to the person who recommended it, and their name is Jessie. Don't be ashamed that our education system has left her out. Honestly, have you ever heard of her before? No. You Okay. Honestly, no, but... I will now tell everyone about her. (laughs) I had literally never heard of her. And as like a feminist and a neuroscientist, I feel like my education did totally fail me. Yeah. And it left me in the dark about this. Like she's a total babe of a human being. So just to summarize her incredible life, Rita was a Sephardic Jewish feminist. She was a Nobel laureate. She eventually became an Italian senator She was a doctor, a scientist, an Instagram baddie, an influencer. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Those last you made those up. (laughs) (laughs) She lived in like the 1940s. Who made? I was like, oh, okay, okay. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) she she was the OG Instagram baddie. So she made one of the. (laughs) Did you like that? Yeah. She made one of the most important discoveries in modern neuroscience while literally on the run from Nazis. Um, yes, she is an incredibly interesting person who faced insane challenges and persecutions for basically her entire life and still managed to accomplish more than pretty much anyone ever. (laughs) 
I mean, yeah. Already, I know I'll never do anything. Nothing I'll do will be worthwhile in comparison. <laughs> Same, honestly. Rita is just a total all around queen. I like that name too. Rita yeah. is cute. It's my mom's middle name. <gasps> so, why didn't I know that? I know. It's Francis. Can you imagine like a baby Rita now? Like it's such an old school name. Like baby Rita, little baby Rita. I like it. Little Ri Ri. <laughs> Rita and her twin sister were born in 1909 in Turin, Italy. And their mm-hmm. parents were Adamo Levi and Adele Montalcini. Ooh. Adele. Everybody in this story has a good name. Yeah. those These are great names. I need to choose my next topic based on the name only. <laughs> based on the name. Search good names. Um, Her father, Adamo, was a mathematician and electrical engineer, and her mother was like a renowned painter. Oh, so she was destined for greatness. Yeah, she had really good genes. Um, Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, her father was super into very traditional gender roles. Well, it's 1909. So Yeah, I mean, that's not unfair. Um, I just found out recently that my grandmother actually got a full ride scholarship to uh, Mary Harden Baylor to study nursing and she had to not go because of the, of world war II. That's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of in the same, like, obviously hers was a lot later, but like in the same mindset, like women stay home and help and take care of stuff. Right. Did she go to work in world war II? Yeah, she did. Going to school. Yeah. Yeah. So Rita's dad, (laughs) um, Adamo basically felt that if his daughters chose to go to college, it would distract them from what he felt should be their primary goals, i.e. like being wives and being moms. So Mm -hmm. it would because of education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes it'd be like that. I guess so. Yeah. Right. People today are still like this. What are we (laughs) going to do about it? They're wrong. Yeah. Oh, my God. There's this woman's TikTok, Sydney, that I found. Mm-hmm. Who she's literally like an anti-feminist, and she does TikToks about how she serves her husband. Did you just throw up in your mouth? Yes, that almost okay. <laughs> that almost made me literally spit out my hot toddy. Who who is that? Who are you? I've we've never met. But she's like, I stay home and I do what my husband says, and blah blah blah. And if you don't agree with me, does like, she want to come home and serve wrong. my husband? Because a bitch is busy. <laughs> <laughs> Eric's like, what's for dinner? And I'm like, I don't know. What are you cooking? <laughs> hot dogs. Put it in the microwave. <laughs> you know you love hot dogs, Eric. Oh, my God. I forgot to tell you about this. On Sunday, I literally woke up and he made me crepes. <gasps> That's so nice. What did he do wrong? Nothing. He didn't even do anything wrong. He Aww, just, I just woke up and he had Eric. made crepes. It was so sweet. So uh, Rita was not about to take this whole attitude from her dad lying down. At the age of 20, mm-hmm. after watching a very close friend of hers die of cancer, she decided no matter what, she was going to become a medical doctor. Cool. In 1988, she wrote an autobiography, and I love the title. It's called In Praise of Imperfection. Mm-hmm. And she wrote, my experience in childhood and adolescence of the subordinate role played by the female in a society run entirely by men had convinced me that I was just not cut out to be a wife. That's... That is a vibe. <laughs> a whole vibe. I'm a wife, but Nothing. I'm like, maybe I'll get a divorce. And she know. never gets married. She never. <laughs> Just like, kidding, Michelle. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> she lived forever, like into her 90s, and she never got married because she was like, I'm just not cut out for that. Because she was a fr- like probably also a little bit of like fear in yeah. becoming what she didn't want to or uh, subscribing to those roles. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I People at that time who chose not to. Maybe she was a lesbian. <gasps> Maybe she was. I don't know. I never found anything about her romantic life. Yeah. Get it. Whatever you want to do. If get you it. didn't, then she was probably gay. Love that for you. Whatever your vibe Join was, I'm here for it. So Same. Okay. Rita basically went to her dad and was like, I'm not going to do things the way that you want me to so you can get with the program or get lost. And her dad tried to talk her out of it. He was like, oh, it's really hard. Going to med school is going to take a long time. And she was like, I am not worried about that at all. She so she basically was she has this quote also from her autobiography. And I'll link that in our show notes where she was really resentful of just living in a world where she felt like everything was decided for her by men. So she was like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it anymore. And more power to you. Same. She was the OG like bra burner of that generation, you know. I'm here for that. So people describe her as a lovely person 
with very obvious intelligence and determination in her light steel gray eyes. She considered herself to be like woefully uneducated to this point where she's about to graduate from college. So she crammed four years worth of Greek, Latin, and mathematics into eight months so that she could apply for medical school. That's so cool. Yeah. So she and her dad had been fighting over the matter for a really long time, and her father finally agreed she could go to medical school because at the time she was young enough that she needed his permission. So she took her entrance exams at the age of 21, and she enrolled in the Turin School of Medicine in 1930. Okay. Yeah. So while in medical school, she starts doing research in the lab of this famous kind of eccentric scientist named Giuseppe Levi, who was interested. That's also a good name. Yeah, he was interested in the development of the nervous system, a.k.a. the brain and spinal cord, right? Mm -hmm. So a few years later, she graduates summa cum laude, like top of her class in 1936, when she began a three-year fellowship in neurology and psychiatry while she continued her research in Giuseppe Levi's lab. And so Dr. Levi, and again, I know her last name is Levi, and there's no relation. They just happen to have the same name or whatever. (laughs) So... He gave her this insane task of trying to figure out how the convolutions of the brain are formed, which all of these established scientists had not been able to do up to this point. What um, is a convolution? Ooh. <laughs> what is that? You're a brain. You are a brain scientist. So I know, you know, Yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> I'm super glad you asked about this because I could literally go on about it all day. Um, so the cerebral cortex I've made a mistake. Here. No, no, <laughs> I won't go crazy. Just like a quick explanation. So, okay. The cerebral cortex is the outside portion of your brain, right? And mm-hmm. it has these wrinkles in it that increase the surface area of the cortex and it makes the structure more stable. We now know that the brain basically makes these folds to decrease the distance between two neurons so that when they make connections, information can travel faster because it doesn't have to travel so far. There's this really cool story. In 2015, there were these two other badass female neuroscientists from the University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and they discovered that the developing human brain folds exactly the same mathematical way as when you crumple a sheet of paper into a ball. So it basically just folds up that way. Why would they ever want to know that? That's a great (laughs) question, but now we know exactly how the brain folds when it's being formed. That's interesting we don't know what exactly the evolutionary function is besides making space for more neurons um but we don't know exactly why some animals have it and some don't so like we have it yeah and what what other animals have that so we pretty much i'm obviously very interested in animals are tigers involved (laughs) in this study at all uh no i wish they were (laughs) they probably have a really crumpled brain yeah because they're They're probably ready to yes they're smart Exactly. So um, we vaguely know that animals with high levels of intelligence like dolphins, whales, elephants, and baboons have convolutions in their cortex like we do. Not surprising at all. Yeah. Dolphins and whales actually have many more wrinkles in their brain than we do, while elephants have these like massive brains, but they have only about a third as many folds as human brains. So dolphins are smarter than us is what you're saying. We know that they have more neurons than we do. That's crazy. Yeah. Dolphins have more neurons. They have more wrinkles than we do. And so that's really interesting. And we know that yeah. we know now that things like like whales are basically capable of of their own language and they have different dialects right. and things like that. So basically you see these brain wrinkles in super smart animals, and that's how the cortex crumples. <laughs> wow. Love a neuroscience dad joke. Is there honestly anything better? I mean, yes. <laughs> Several better things, but I know you love cookies. that moment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it with you. Yeah, Thanks. cookies, cake, Thank ice you. cream, coffee. Oh, honestly, coffee, spaghetti, pasta, bake that pasta <laughs> bake you make. Oh, I do make a mean pasta bake. Now that we're talking about Italy, we should have been eating pasta for this. We honestly, we should do a thing where we eat the food of wherever we're talking about. What are we doing? Hey, but if we do it about America, what are we gonna eat? French fries? Can we eat French fries? I mean, I love French fries. <laughs> this is the second time it's come up. I think we need help. I need French fries is what I'm hearing. Always. Like counseling and fries. Yes. Okay. 
So Rita had basically been assigned to this ridiculous project during her schooling that no one had ever been able to figure out in the history of ever. And literally, they didn't figure it out until 2015. Oh, shit. Yes. And she was studying this in the 30s. So after she spent a while with it, she went to her boss and was like, this is ridiculous. No one can do this. <laughs> Me and at the simplest task. <laughs> honestly, same. And surprisingly, he was like, yeah, you're right. But I figured if anyone could do it, it would probably be you. So then he put her on a more manageable project, which was studying how the brain developed in chicken embryos. And that's actually a really common neuroscience uh, development model organism to this day. Chicken embryos? Yeah. And she was one of the first ones to study it. Unfortunately, everyone who heard in this story that Rita is Jewish and graduated in Italy in 1936 probably knows what's coming next. Dun, dun, dun. When Mussolini declared his dictatorship in 1922, anti-Semitism yep. had begun growing in Europe and it became increasingly difficult to be a Jewish person almost anywhere on the continent, but especially in Germany and Italy. Yeah. In 1938, Musso, uh, Mussolini enacted Musso. several... <laughs> Musso. <laughs> Musso. That's, that's, the, on, that's his nickname. We're on a oh, nickname word. basis. <laughs> old Musso. <laughs> oh, old Musso, my dog. <laughs> My dog so, Musso. <laughs> honestly, can't believe I said that. Musso. <laughs> I like so, it. It's like too casual. Okay. In 1938, up, Musso. Musso? <laughs> my dog Musso. No, not my dog. <laughs> We're not friends. <laughs> nah. Mussolini enacted several fascist and anti Semitic laws, like the Manifesto per la Difesta della Raza. I'm so sorry for butchering that. If anybody speaks Italian, just know that I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> and it basically is, in English, it's the Manifesto of Race. And that was basically a law that stripped Jewish citizens of their Italian citizenship and outlawed them from keeping government or professional positions in Italy. I never understood this. So my understanding is that basically he did it to, in order to be like friendly with Hitler, like to show Hitler that he was on his team. Whatever. If you're ever trying to be friends with Hitler, stop you done and fucked ask up. yourself, <laughs> what am I doing? I My name is all Musso. Agree. <laughs> we could all agree in hindsight that the Nazis were the bad guys, right? That's not like a controversial topic. I mean, some people don't even think that that happened. Yeah, that's... If you think that, stop listening to this podcast right yeah, now. Yeah, you are not a friend of the podcast. Get out of here. <laughs> we are not You friends. can at me if you want to. We can fight. <laughs> yeah, come, come at me on that one. So this was kind of the first in a series of laws that would basically strip Italian Jewish people of their civil rights based on some bullshit, quote unquote, science mm -hmm. that said, quote, true or pure Italians were descendants of the Aryan race. At this point, Jewish people were being stripped of their titles and property and the hostility from Italian citizens toward Jewish Italians was open and really apparent. Yeah. So by 1939, the environment had become so hostile for Rita that she was forced to withdraw from her university and quit her job. She also says that she quit because she didn't want to expose her coworkers and peers to the danger that came with being associated with a Jewish scientist. So um, she's a good person on she's top of being super smart. Authentically a wow. saint. So, I mean, can you imagine like not only the fear for yourself, but she's like no. thinking of her coworkers, not me. That's that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, y'all better hide me quick. <laughs> Hurry up. Be my friend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she accepted a position to continue her research at the Neurological Institute in Belgium. But as soon as she was getting settled into her new role, Mussolini formed a formal alliance with Hitler and they began mm -hmm. enacting even more radical racial laws. So fearing for the lives of herself and her family after Germany invaded Brussels, uh, Rita returned back to Italy in 1940. I will never understand why it took the rest of the world so long to intervene. Insert political pause here. <laughs> Heavy political pause. <laughs> While the world was completely collapsing around her, Rita was determined to continue her research. So she says that she immediately, as soon as she got back to Italy, found a way to set up a laboratory in her bedroom while bombs wow. fell all across her homeland, eventually destroying her neighborhood, Rita just moved her microscope to the basement of her home. She made scalpels out of sewing needles and bought a pair of watchmaker's tweezers to use as forceps. 
1941, the bombing was so intense around Turin that she and her family were forced to flee into the countryside. As she was leaving her home, possibly forever, one of the few personal possessions that Rita took with her was her microscope. During the war, she continued studying brain development in chicken embryos, so she would go around to local farmers and convince them that she needed chicken eggs to feed her starving children, which she didn't actually have. That's awesome. And she did this so that she could continue her experiments. So these experiments that she performed while running for her life and surviving World War II are the ones that led her to develop the theory that eventually won her a Nobel Prize. Honestly, like, imagine the come up story here where (laughs) Hitler and old Musso rolling in their graves (laughs) that this woman that they were trying to exterminate ends up surviving and winning a Nobel Prize. That's awesome. And she has a really powerful statement about that from her Nobel Prize acceptance speech. She says, if I had not been discriminated against or had not suffered persecution, I would never have received the Nobel Prize, which enabled me to help so many more people. That's so, that's awesome. Which is like, honestly gives me chills. Can you imagine being on the run for your life, like hiding your identity and doing research, I can barely convince myself to do research when I haven't eaten breakfast. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, I think like these are the kind of people who should write autobiographies, not these idi- yeah. other idiots that were they're like in jail writing their autobiography about murdering 200 people. No one gives a fuck yeah. about you. We yeah. this woman deserves the accolades and the attention. And maybe this should be required reading. You know what I mean? Like this is the kind Honestly, of Honestly a hundred percent literature that should be required reading. This is important. Yeah. And honestly, like I feel like the fact that as a scientist, I didn't know her name. Yeah. Is that's a is problem. embarrassing and it's sad. And I think fuck Watson and Crick, especially them. So if you remember the name of only one scientist, let it be Dr. Rita Levi Montalcini. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why we're doing this, right? Like, because yeah. these people are left out. And if yeah. we aren't actively searching, we don't see their stories because somebody decided it wasn't important enough. Well, that's just not true. This is yeah. so, imagine if, imagine already the amount of people that would be impacted by her story because they've also fled their yeah. their homes and had to kind of yeah. like pick up wherever they landed and make a life for themselves and continue you know pushing and learning I mean it's just like a great example of how we should all yeah. be for little girls for people who are refugees for like anybody who needs a hero Rita is right it. while Rita and her family are on the run she reads a paper by a renowned developmental biologist named Victor Hamburger Oh, my God. I love that name. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, every time I read it in my notes, it makes me so hungry. <laughs> so ha- That's a good one. <laughs> hamburger was also studying chicken embryos. We're not going to call him Hamburger, are we? Can we call him Victor? Victor. No, we can call hamburger. him Victor. <laughs> I mean, we got Musso, so Hamburger it <laughs> Musso, is. Musso and Hamburger. <laughs> he was also studying chicken embryos, and he discovered that when a limb, like a wing was removed during the chick's development, the nerves that would normally grow out from the spinal cord to reach that area that the wing would normally be in were fewer and they were shorter than the normal nerves. So he developed this theory that when the limbs are forming during development, they produce something that makes these peripheral nerves want to grow out of the spinal cord toward the new limb. Oh, wow. And he suggested that it was some kind of organizer that was responsible for the growth of these neurons that normally innervate the wings, Mm -hmm. right? And after reading this paper, which was super influential in the field, Rita got to work because she was like, I want to do these same experiments that Hamburger did, (laughs) Victor. (laughs) Um, But she doesn't necessarily agree with his findings. She's like, I don't know what it is, but I just think he's a, she's like, I think he's close, but I think he's a little bit off. So by performing the same experiments where she removes a wing during the chicken's development, Rita comes up with this idea that there's some kind of nutrient that keeps the nerve alive as they move toward the new limb. And that by removing the wing, you deplete the nerve of that nutrient. And so the nerves die. And remember, Mm. she's doing all of this scientific work, this research, the literature searches, the sectioning, the staining, the limb removal, the microscopy. 
while she's literally on the run from Nazis, which is crazy. I bet her dad is like eating his <laughs> yeah. bird. Her dad is like, whoops. And he's like looking at her like, that girl is smarter than me. They're like in their basement while the bombs go off. And he's like, you know, I may have misjudged so I, I know this might not be a great time. <laughs> I'd like to just extend my formal but... apology for not believing in I'd you. I'd like to go ahead and eat my words along with a hamburger. <laughs> Wow. Because of the persecution she faced, it was impossible for her to publish her findings in her home country. So her old advisor, Dr. Levi, helped her send her manuscripts to Belgium where they were published in 1942. So this is mid-World War II. Wow. Damn. Crazy. So she and her family were forced to move to Florence where she lived until 1944. Rita was actually in Florence when American troops liberated the city, forcing out the German occupiers. So she was literally working there as a medical doctor, like volunteering to treat injured refugees and soldiers. Damn, she's the most selfless person. Authentically. So meanwhile, while Rita is literally in the trenches, our boy Hamburger like reads the paper about her findings. <laughs> I thought you were joking about his like... name. I forgot that was his real name. <laughs> no. I thought we moved so him, real but that's his real name. Okay. No. So unlike most people who are told someone thinks they're wrong, he like read her work, which completely contradicted his. And he was like, I agree with her findings. She's right. And I'm wrong. I've never I've never heard of her. <laughs> never. And by her, I mean that kind of reaction. <laughs> never had someone have that reaction. But I, I love it. I love some humble pie. That's cool. Yeah. So he was so convinced and impressed by her work that he basically convinced her to move after the war was over to St. Louis to collaborate with him. So she moved to St. Louis. She took a job at Washington University where she was a professor for over 30 years. Up until very recently when she passed away, Rita was a professor emeritus at Washington University, which is like one of the highest honors a university can give you. Love that. Love that. Applause. Yeah. Love that. That's so cool. She continued the research with chicken embryo that she'd been performing during the war, and eventually she isolated the mysterious nerve survival substance that she had been uh, hypothesizing about while she was on the run in the Italian countryside, because obviously now she has access to better equipment. She has a colleague who's helping her um, isolate these proteins, and she named the substance nerve growth factor, or NGF. And NGF okay. was the first of many cell growth factors that scientists would find in animals. And Rita and others would continue to research NGF. And it has given scientists a new way to study neural growth and potentially battle disorders of neural degeneration like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Oh, that's cool. That's so cool. Yeah. So she talks a lot. All of from chickens. Yeah. And a watch tweezer. Yeah, actually, yeah. They designed an anti-serum. So she and her colleague, Dr. Cohen, were able to basically chart out the complete role for nerve growth factor. And it became clear that it was basically essential to the differentiation and the health of nerve cells. And ultimately, this is what she won a Nobel Prize for. After this incredible finding, she continues working at Washington University um, she opens another lab in Rome, and she splits her time between St. Louis and her home country. In 1986, Rita says that she was reading an Agatha Christie mystery novel called Evil Under the Sun. And she did this interview <laughs> with Scientific American where she said, at the moment that I was finding out about the criminal, they called me and told me I was awarded the Nobel Prize. Wow. She laughs, getting up to retrieve the book from the hallway. She points to a handwritten note on the very second to last page where she had marked call from Stockholm <laughs> and the time that the call came in. Oh, that's so cool. She says, so I was very happy about it, but I wanted very much to know the end of the story. She is so cool. She's cooler She's than so me. cool. She's cooler than all of yeah. us. Fact. <laughs> she continued doing research literally until her death at 103 years of age. She has won numerous awards. She was that just gave me a chill, honestly. Me too. She has won numerous awards. She was the president of the Italian Multiple Sclerosis Association. She was the first ever female member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, which is a huge honor. She and her twin sister, who went on to become a world renowned artist. Oh. Cool. Established a foundation that provides mentors, counseling, and financial assistance to students who wish to enter the arts or sciences. Damn. For several hours every week until she died, she would meet with young students in her laboratory at the Institute of Neurobiology 
at the National Research Council in Rome and would talk with them about their interests and her experiments and how they could get involved in science. Y'all, if you ever think that something's stopping you, just think about Rita because she overcame everything. Most people, when their dad told them they couldn't do something, they would stop. Yeah, absolutely. Like she was so aware of who she was and how powerful she was that she wasn't going to let even her dad's limitation stop her. And then she continued. She was like, anyway, she literally is the is the example of anyway, carry on. (laughs) Yeah, she is the epitome of like just getting shit done. Yeah. So if you need someone to look up to, if you need someone to read more about her autobiography is honestly awesome just an incredible book she's like a funny she's really funny she could have made this such a like downer situation and she has like such a good sense of humor about it and she's just a really really awesome person wow so thank you so much that's my story that is so cool rita is so cool usually usually our our episodes are like huge bummers but (laughs) i mean this was kind of a bummer but this is like the overcoming yeah this is how you overcome a bummer situation. Well, thank you so much, Sydney. I think like we need we need this. We yeah. need more of this. Um, I love this is like part of our journey is to bring to light. This is like the coolest. This might be my new favorite episode. And thank you to our listeners for recommending stuff because I had never heard about her. And I'm so yes. happy that a listener reached out to me to say, can you do a story about her? Yeah, we love that. Check us out on our social meds. Send us those DMs. Instagram, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Twitter. If you have time, subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Or wherever you listen. Remember, malpractice makes perfect. <laughs> That's our new catchphrase. <laughs> do, 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 do.